So welcome everybody. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I see that we have representatives from around the globe. Um, I'm currently in the state of Washington, which is in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. We are currently in um, uh, severe drought uh, with very high temperatures and wildfires burning uh, throughout the, the region. Um, uh, climate, um, uh, emergency, uh, clearly. And uh, today I wear a number of hats. The primary one is for the Society for Ecological Restoration, uh, but also I'm vice chair of the Global Partnership on Forest and Landscape Restoration and on faculty at the University of Montana. So um, what we're about is really the, the how to uh, best uh, improve uh, the global situation from the new UN decade on ecosystem restoration. We know that we have great opportunities now to uh, produce livelihoods, provide food security, and address the, the current climate challenge. Um, but to do this, we really need to have a, a common understanding of how to design and implement successful restoration projects and to uh, successfully uh, bring along stakeholders and, and local communities. Uh, for the decade, there are a number of global partners um, and uh, a great consultation to develop a strategy for uh, the decade. And in the context of the decade, ecosystem restoration is um, defined as encompassing a wide continuum of activities that contribute to protecting intact ecosystems and repairing degraded ecosystems. And this is a reference to the SER International Standards for the Practice of Ecological Restoration and the Restorative Continuum, which is shown here, which um, broadly defines restoration so that um, activities that um, can reduce societal impacts on the left side of the the graphic up through improving ecosystem management, the repair of ecosystem function, all the way up through the full recovery of, of NATO, native ecosystems um, are part of the restorative continuum. And so these are where we can uh, provide a range of activities. SER and IUCN uh, Commission on Ecosystem Management have held now three uh, fora uh, addressing uh, critical points on uh, biodiversity and uh, global forest restoration in, in 2017, uh, then on uh, uh, restoration and uh, defining global biodiversity targets uh, for the uh, post-2020 framework. And our third one, which was a virtual event um, this uh, spring, um, which addressed um, three themes important to um, developing a common vision for the UN decade. The first was um, to uh, develop or contribute to the development of general principles for ecosystem restoration and the development of standards of practice for restorative activities across the continuum. The second was to define net gain or improvement from our restoration activities, including how it can be measured, prioritized, and standardized. The third component was development of a framework for prioritizing restorative activities, uh, in particular, of course, ecological restoration. So um, uh, the fora um, was able to uh, include 58 participants, from 23 countries and 41 um, organizations to uh, consider uh, these issues, uh, which we'll um, present and discuss today. And um, as a, a byproduct of the, the third global forum, we had people identify key words um, that they thought were um, especially appropriate for uh, the decade. And you can see that opportunity, hope, collaboration, and coordination, and challenge all uh, pop up. And we believe that 
the, the collaboration is the only way that we can, can move forward um, with the UN decade and to be successful in it. I'm going to turn over to Kara Nelson right now, and thank you. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, I also live in the Western United States where we're really feeling the impacts of climate change and where restoration is a really important strategy for improving both biodiversity and human well being. I'm a professor at University of Montana. For those of you participating regularly in the webinar series, um, you know I'm lead of CEM's Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group. And I also have a long history with the Society for Ecological Restoration, including serving as a past chair. What we're gonna do on our webinar today is to talk about conceptual advances in defining restorative activities that were made during the forum event that Jim described. And so we'll be taking um, these advances one by one, running through the three themes from the Global Forum, the principles, defining net gain, and then prioritization of restorative actions. And these are actually a set of pre-recorded videos and I'll, I'll be coming in after each video to set up the next video. Um, the videos are being run by me here with my unfortunately slow internet today. Please put in the chat if the videos are not running appropriately and I'll turn it over to Brock to run them from his end. Um, again, um, use the chat for networking, but as you're watching the videos, as questions arise, put those questions in the Q&A window, not in the chat window, because we'll only be looking in the Q&A window for pulling those questions out. And again, we'll have Q&A um, at the end of the presentation. Okay, so the first theme was principles for ecosystem restoration. And some of you may be thinking, wait, haven't we been talking about principles and standards for ecological restoration, for nature-based solutions? We've had quite a few presentations now within this um, uh, CEM restoration webinar series, even on principles and standards. Well, ecosystem restoration under the decade is being defined as all restorative activities along the whole gradient that you see in front of you in this figure, ranging from reducing societal impacts over on the left all the way to full ecosystem recovery on the right. And of course the strategy on the right is ecological restoration. But, but the decade embraces the full umbrella of activities that can be restorative. And so again, while we have principles for ecological restoration, for nature-based solutions, for forest landscape restoration, for sustainable agriculture. What was missing were principles for defining restorative activities under the decade. And so we tackled this as one of the themes in the Global Forum, and you can see listed here the individuals who participated in this theme. And then after this event in April, there were seven people who volunteered to take the ideas and to massage them further into draft principles for the decade. Those were released in the decade launch report. And I'm gonna play a video now that walks you through the nine principles for ecosystem restoration. Again, please let me know if, this, if the sound is not playing appropriately. Good afternoon, good evening. I am Christophe Bezassier, forestry officer, uh, acting as coordinator of the forest and landscape restoration mechanism within the forestry division in FAO. I am also the co-leader of the task force on best practices. Briefly, I want to introduce first the task force on best practices. It is a collaborative effort on knowledge capitalization and dissemination including collection and sharing of good practices. To date, we have 46 member organizations, which represent a total number of 120 
people. One of the priority needs identified within this task force was the definition of ecosystem restoration principles to address the lack of a common vision on ecosystem restoration and also to serve as the basis for criteria to qualify ecosystem restoration and good practices. We decided to work in strong partnership with the Society for Ecological Restoration and IUCN to jointly develop those principles for ecosystem restoration. As a first step, we decided to take stock of published principle for specific restorative activities through an internal consultation within the task force. Based on this consultation, we identified published principles across the restorative continuum, and we selected the one applicable at the global scale and to multiple biomes and ecosystems. The second step, we develop a draft principle for the UN decade, uh, again through an internal consultation, based on 15 publications, and we combine the principle thematically to develop the set of the eight principles selected for this uh, consultation. As a third step, uh, we presented the principles at the third global forum on ecological restoration uh, and we develop uh, a description for each principle uh, on this occasion. Two workshops uh, were held to receive feedback from the expert participants to this global forum and after the forum a small group of participants revised uh, the principles uh, and the description of, this, of each principle uh, and uh, we are now with uh, the fourth step feedback uh, from the UN Decade Coordination Group, the Science Task Force led by IUCN, the Task Force on Best Practices members and the Global Forum of Participants. Based on those multiple consultations, we have now revised principles with a description for each one to be presented today. What are the next steps after the presentation today? We will organize a global consultation to be published on the UN Decade website uh, in July, uh, from mid-June to mid-July 2021. Then, we will revise the principle based uh, on this global consultation from mid-July to mid-August. We will finalize the publication uh, with the idea to present the final principles and the description and the visual identity at the IUCN Congress um, to be held in Marseille uh, from uh, 3 to 11 September 2021. And finally, uh, after this presentation at the IUCN Congress, we will draft standards of practice for each principle. We already initiated this activity uh, at the third global forum on ecological restoration, but we will continue and improve those standards of practice by end of 2021. Thank you for your attention. Hello, I am Manuel Guariguata. I am principal scientist at the Center for International Forestry Research and the World Agroforestry Center. I will be presenting the first five draft principles of ecosystem restoration. All relevant stakeholders and rights holders with a particular focus on underrepresented groups should be identified and engaged and integrated throughout the planning, implementation, and monitoring phases of restoration programs and projects. Such engagement and integration can be achieved, for example, by securing regular access to information and knowledge, seeking free prior and informed consent, building dialogue, trust, and mutual respect through inclusive and transparent government processes with shared objectives and values enhancing tenure, property, and land rights, and ensuring fair and equitable distribution of benefits and responsibilities based on consensus. 
All types of ecosystems can benefit from ecosystem restoration, including natural, semi-natural, productive, cultural, and urban systems. Major categories of restorative activities include reduction of negative environmental and societal impacts, such as non-sustainable resource extraction, removal of contaminants and pollutants, rehabilitation of ecosystem functions and services, for example, in mining sites or degraded watersheds, and partially or fully returning the system to the state it would have been if degradation had not occurred. Ecosystem restoration should enhance protection, conservation, and recovery activities, and it should aim to achieve the greatest possible net gain for ecosystems, native biodiversity, and human well being. It should also aim at delivering multiple benefits through nature based solutions that satisfy the full range of societal challenges and needs currently facing our planet. Any restorative intervention should address the direct and indirect drivers of ecosystem degradation, fragmentation, and biodiversity loss. Key to these actions are efforts at eliminating perverse incentives that promote ecosystem degradation while adopting sustainable management practices. Likewise, applying landscape-wide approaches so that they integrate production and conservation and that consider reducing the environmental impacts of urbanization and infrastructure development. To this end, the application of policy instruments known to avoid, reduce, and or reverse land degradation, including legal, regulatory, and social and economic dimensions should be considered. Indigenous, traditional, local, scientific, and practitioner knowledge should be integrated into restoration activities to the extent possible to promote evidence-based decision-making during project and program design, implementation, and monitoring. To facilitate exchange of knowledge, systems and networks for documenting, integrating, and sharing should be developed and made widely available through regularly updated, easily accessible, understandable, and culturally appropriate media. The inclusion of different types of knowledge will help ensure that interventions are properly tailored to local context, effectively implemented, and equitably shared. Thank you. Hello. It's a pleasure to be presenting principles six to nine of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. I am Anita Jederiksen. I am the global leader on forest landscape restoration in WWF. WWF is a global partner of the UN DACED, and we are very happy to be <laughs> global partners. Well, let's go to the principles. Principle six is tailored to the local context while considering the larger landscapes or seascapes and social, ecological, and cultural settings. Ecosystem restoration is undertaken at appropriate scale from small areas of less than a hectare to large landscapes or seascapes. In all cases, both the local and landscape context and its ecological and social dimensions must be considered in project planning and evaluation. Consideration of the local context aligns project goals with both local ecological and social needs. Also, tailoring projects to the large to the larger landscape is just as important. Understanding the landscape context and work with stakeholders are necessary to plan the intervention based on subsidies among ecosystems, connectivity and transborder effects, as well as the types of management actions needed. It also allows to consider areas to be conserved and drivers that must be addressed. The landscape context must also be considered in evaluating the effects of restoration interventions as some variables can only be evaluated at the landscape level. Principle 7 is based on well-defined short and long-term ecological and socio-economic objectives and goals. 
At the initial phases of planning, a restoration project, program intervention, long-term goals, and measure objectives for milestones must be established. Goals and objectives must stipulate the type of action and magnitude of change desire and the associated time frame where appropriate. This allows the development and the communication of the action plan, as well as the effective evaluation of success and adaptive management. Principle eight, plans and undertakes monitoring, evaluation and adaptive management through the lifetime of the project and program. For monitoring to be effective, selected indicators should match the actions, objectives, and goals of restoration projects, programs, and initiatives, and should be developed during the planning phase. Monitoring should ideally start before implementation to allow pre-restoration measurements. Monitoring the ecological, social, economic, and livelihood outcomes of restoration projects, programs, and initiatives should be undertaken to understand whether or not these are achieving their objectives and goals. Because restoration is a long-term endeavor and therefore changing conditions are inevitable, adaptive management is crucial. It allows an iterative process of monitoring, reflecting, improving, and crafting new action as needed, helps to identify any and planned results. Also, adaptive management promotes social learning, capacity development, and communication among stakeholder groups and communities of practice at local, national, and global scales, and above all, to get to better results and impacts. Principle nine, integrates policies and measures to ensure longevity, maintain funding, and where appropriate, enhance and scale up interventions. Relevant policies, measures, strategies, and plans must be mapped, adopted, and integrated in the design and implementation in all scales. Successful ecosystem restoration projects and programs, which are environmental, sustainable, and economic viable, should have broader influence and higher replicability potential in the long term. This is particularly important as these successful initiatives should go beyond localized actions to inform and influence the design of policies and measures at local, national, and global levels for halting and preventing ecosystem degradation and scale. Thank you very much for listening to principles six to nine of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. I'd like to thank Anita, Manuel, and Christoph for preparing those videos for us. And as Christoph mentioned at the outset of his video with Next Steps, there is a global consultation now on these principles. Becca put in the chat, how can I get involved? The uh, immediate way to get involved is to provide your feedback on the principles through the UN Decade website. The principles were published in the launch report for the decade, but there is a global consultation process that includes a survey. It's listed also on the UN Decade website. And Bethany uh, Walder, if you could post that link directly in the chat, I would be grateful. I just posted it, but I didn't put any information. So the link I just posted is the link that Kara is talking about. Great. So we'll move on to our next theme, which is defining net gain for ecosystem restoration. Um, the definition of net gain is also included in the global consultation on the principles. And that is because net gain is referenced within the principles for ecosystem restoration. And so we know that restorative activities aim to address societal challenges and improve human well-being as well as provide adversity benefits. But what does this mean exactly? How much benefit do we need to have for people or for nature? And right now on the screen you're seeing recovery wheels for ecological integrity and biodiversity on the right-hand side, 
where there's different variables and you can measure through a restorative action improvement within each of these variables. And on the left-hand side, similarly for social benefits, with different kinds of social benefits and achievements for each of these through restorative actions. However, to define, to be defined as a restorative activity, what does that mean in terms of net gain? How much net gain and um, how much in, within each of these different uh, schemes? So this was addressed through the, a theme within the Global Forum and I'm briefly just putting the participants in this theme from the event up on the screen and to thank all of them. And we now will have a video on defining that game. Hi, my name is Bethany Walder, and I'm the executive director of the Society for Ecological Restoration. It is my great pleasure to be with you here today at this UN Decade on Ecosystem Restor Restoration launch event. What an exciting and thrilling time we are entering now with the UN Decade and this global recognition of the importance of ecological restoration. I'm here to talk with you about the progress that a small subgroup of the Global Forum, the third biennial Global Forum on Ecological Restoration made regarding the definition of net gain. And I wanna start by thanking all of our partners at IUCN CEM, and all of the people who participated in the entire Global Forum, and especially those who worked on this definition. And my job is to share with you first, why do we need a definition of net gain? Why was this one of the things that we discussed at the Global Forum? And we believe it's very important to be able to articulate the additive value of restoration to conservation and sustainable resource use. So when we put these three things together, then we're able to actually start measuring if we're converting from a global state of ecosystem degradation to a global state of ecosystem improvement. And to do that, we wanna measure net gain at the project level, at the site level, at the ecosystem level, all the way up and roll that up into what that means globally. But we've gotta start very locally. It's also important that we have a de definition of net gain so that we can more effectively illustrate the mutual benefits to people and nature of restorative activities. If people understand how restoration is improving conditions for both people and the natural world, then they will be more likely to support it politically, financially, et cetera. And of course, we need to measure, be able to measure net gain because it's a tool for measuring the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration's goal to increase the area of healthy ecosystems and put a stop to their loss and degradation. So we've developed this draft definition and it's just a draft and we're still accepting feedback on that. The draft definition is that net gain is a measurable positive change in ecosystem integrity, native biodiversity and human well-being that results from a combination of sustainable resource use, conservation, and restoration. Net gain should be measurable at any scale, including the ecosystem and landscape or seascape scales, and sustained over time. There are a series of considerations that really help flesh out this definition, and I just wanna go through those briefly. First, net gain can be measured at the project or program scale, and at the individual site, ecosystem, or landscape seascape levels, as I said earlier. And to do so, we need to assess change as compared to the conditions that existed before the restorative project or program began. In addition, and we spent a lot of time in the forum talking about this, net gain should be defined by the goals of stakeholders, prioritizing vulnerable communities and those living within the landscape, but doing so in the context of the public interest. For example, using the sustainable development goals or nature's contributions to people or the global biodiversity framework or other broad public interest objectives to set that context for, for human health and well-being. 
um, as we look at de developing these, these stakeholder objectives. Net gain should also be easily applicable and understandable and measured regardless of where a project or restorative act action falls on the restorative continuum. I know that other speakers will be sharing the restorative continuum with you today, so I'm not going to include that here. But in that context, we need to recognize that it needs to be measured at relevant time scales, including that sometimes there are short-term adverse effects that are then negated as the beneficial as the beneficial aspects of the project kick in. And sometimes both from an ecological and a human health and well-being perspective, that can take a long time. The metrics should also incorporate key aspects of ecosystem integrity as well as key aspects of human well-being. And finally, projects and programs should not qualify as achieving net gain if the management of trade-offs results in either ecological or social harm. And I wanna close by just sharing some remaining issues we still have to address. First, we're not in agreement yet on the terminology. Should this be net gain, net benefit, net improvement, something else? There are concerns right now that net gain is too economic of a term or that it's too tied to mandatory restoration. In other words, restoration required by regulatory frameworks. So what's the right term that we use to articulate this concept of going from global degradation to global improvement? In addition, we're still working and have quite a bit of, of, of work still to do to define specific metrics that will work across the restorative continuum and across scale. So with that, I'm happy to let you know that I'll be here at the end and can answer any questions you have. But right now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Sangeet, Mani Raja, so she can talk with you about the work we accomplished on defining specific metrics. Thank you so much for your time today. Hello, everyone. My name is Sangeet Mitra Mani Raja, and I'm a consultant with Climate Focus, where I also support the Global Restoration Observatory Initiative. I am very excited to share with you some of the key takeaways that uh, came out of a discussion at the Global Forum held by SER uh, on draft metrics to measure net gain. So early this year, a group of experts, practitioners, and researchers convened to tackle the question of what does net gain mean and how might we begin to think about measuring net gain in the context of restoration. And on the discussion of metrics, um, we, we talked about metrics as a system of measurement and a system of measures that would be different for project level, landscape, country, or global level, and would capture or try to capture improvements um, across ecosystem function, native biodiversity, and human well-being. This is a, um, an image that many of you might be familiar with. It's the restorative continuum developed by the SER, and it describes the range or groups of activities that directly or indirectly support um, the recovery of ecosystem attributes. And as part of this discussion, we considered what would metrics to measure net gain look like across the different categories of the continuum. In addition to that, we also thought about, are there specific metrics that differentiate the measurement of net gain versus broader restoration progress? In other words, are there a subset of metrics that could help us um, evaluate whether a certain activity has um, achieved net gain versus um, just monitoring restoration more broadly? And the group, in answer to this question, identified some considerations for thinking about this subset of metrics that would specifically um, be addressing the question of net gain. In this slide, I highlight some of these considerations and, and share some examples. One of the considerations we discussed was this temporal element and how metrics that evaluate net gain um, have to think of, have to consider the improvements or try to measure improvements that are sustained over time, while at the same time um, acknowledging that there is a balance between 
um, activities short-term impacts, which could be negative in the in the short run, but provide long-term gains um, over over a longer period of time. Another element we discussed was this question of trade-offs and how net gain necessarily implies the possibility of gains on some fronts, but losses on others. And it would be important um, in the measurement of this to acknowledge and manage trade-offs explicitly. Another question we discussed uh, extensively was, where do we draw the line of unacceptable levels of degradations or consequences of a certain restoration activity? And this is what we call the thresholds of harm. And an example that we discussed uh, as being a threshold of harm is the displacement of indigenous peoples and, and lo local communities, that any activity that creates that effect would, would definitely be crossing a, a threshold of harm that does not lead to net gain overall. On this slide, I share with you some draft metrics for net gain that um, are a sample of ideas that were generated in our discussion. And they fall in the two broad groups of social and ecological um, improvements. Um, for example, in the ecological uh, improvements, we discussed ecosystem functions and services restored and sustained. Whereas in the social side, we talked about communities being more self-sustained and not relying on external inputs. Now, these are not metrics per se, um, but these uh, were dimensions that we narrowed down on as being important um, in thinking about and developing the, the set of metrics that would be specific to measuring net gain versus restoration um, more broadly. Another process that um, will be feeding into this um, discussion on net gain is the project indicators work stream as part of the, the GROW initiative. GROW is a multi-stakeholder initiative developed two years ago that born out of the New York De Declaration on Forests uh, Assessment Initiative. And the aim is to help uh, improve global and systematic, systematic monitoring of, of uh, restoration. And as part of the indicators work stream, we are in collaboration with the restoration community developing a common set of core and unified project and program indicators to monitor restoration progress. This initiative is being led by the SER and Climate Focus, and the discussions from the net gain work has fed into the, the GROW indicators work. And we expect, as this GROW indicators work to, to continue, to be feeding into the, the overall discussion and development of net gain metrics. Thank you very much for your attention and time, and I look forward to discussing um, any questions from the audience after uh, the discussion of the other themes at the end of this session? Thank you. I want to thank uh, Bethany and Sangeet for that presentation. Sangeet will not be with us today. These videos are actually the videos presented at the launch of the UN Decade event. But Bethany is here with us for a panel discussion at the end. And I wanna just respond briefly about the continuum graphic and Brian in the chat mentioning that the continuum focuses on native ecosystems. That graphic, and I believe we'll be showing it again, actually goes uh, across all different types of ecosystems. And so under the UN decade, restorative activities include activities in production landscapes, just to clarify. And now we'll turn to the third theme, which is prioritizing restorative activities. And actually, I know I will be showing that graphic again in just a minute. So when we talk about prioritization and restoration, Oftentimes we're talking about opportunities for restoration or restorative activities across the landscape. Here's an example from Colombia where the red list of ecosystems was used along with other factors to prioritize opportunities for restoration. What we're talking about here is something different. We're talking about how to organize ourselves to prioritize which types of activities we should do, which types of restorative activities should be done 
in different places on the landscape. And one of the principles of ecosystem restoration is to achieve the highest level of recovery possible. So where is it that we should be deploying ecological restoration versus other types of restorative activities? And I made a little graphic here to try to display this point. This pie graph shows the proportion of the landscape in seven different types of restorative activities, just hypothetical. And we've got green displaying the proportion of ecological restoration that's done across the landscape. And you can see here in my bottom wheel, a much larger proportion of the landscape in ecological restoration. And so in these two different scenarios, we might see big differences in achieving the highest level of recovery possible, sort of pushing us to the right hand side, the uh, gradient in the continuum. So this concept was tackled again by a small group of folks in the Global Forum who worked on prioritizing activities across the landscape. And I'm thanking them by way of this slide that include, includes all their names. And now we'll go to our final video. Okay, so this is the third component of this panel where we are going to talk about prioritizing a restorative activities framework. And this is a, a draft that will be put for consultation. My name is Liad Vassa. I'm a professor and the UNESCO Chair on Community Sustainability at Brock University in Ontario, Canada, as well as Chair for North America at the Commission on Ecosystem Management and lead of the thematic group on ecosystem governance. My name is Niti Nagabatla. I work for United Nations University, Comparative Regional Integration Studies Institute. I'm also a adjunct professor with McMaster University and a task force member of UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, working closely with FAO. This uh, framework was developed uh, to show how to prioritize eco ecological restoration intervention and considering the potential uh, trade-off as well as maximizing the both human well-being and health as well as ec ecological gains. We decided that we had two guidances that were important to put here for the framework. The first one, which we'll be referring in the framework itself as A, is based on two uh, very important uh, consideration across the world, which are the sustainable development goals, as well as nature's contribution to people. As you can see here on this graph, on the y-axis, we have the sustainable development goals that are related or prioritizing human health and well-being in terms of gains. On the x-axis, we have the sustainable development goals where ecological gains are more prioritized. Now, what happened is when we look at the continuum of ecological restoration and the potential gains on both sides, it will go from one side to the other depending on how people prioritize. If you look at arrow A, for example, the prioritization is more on the human health and well-being. However, if we look at B, we can see here that it's very low on human health and well-being, but very high on ecological gain. So ideally, especially when we consider nature's contribution to people, we want to be more in the middle where we have the C and the arrows. However, there's a difference between the two. In C, for example, probably not as many nature's contribution to people will be considered. And at that point, it may be related to short term or the limitation of the system, and we will be lower on the continuum of ecological restoration. However, ideally, if we want to maximize both human health and well being as well as ecological gains, and we want to optimize both uh, nature's contribution to people as well as the SDGs consideration, we would be probably more towards D. D may be something that is more in the long term. 
the like a second guidelines or guidance that we have is B, and B represent the decision making process. Because we want to have as much representation and inclusion as possible of the stakeholders and the community that are affected by the degraded land and its restoration, we want to make sure that uh, they are well represented. And that brings the issue of bring consensus inclusion of all ways of knowing. So not just scientific knowledge, but also local traditional or indigenous knowledge and perception. To be able to do that, it means that we have also to have a multi-criteria decision process that is transparent and will include different aspects, include such as human health, ecological integrity and biodiversity, technology in terms of availability and feasibility, financial costs, cost-benefit analysis, social acceptability, which is inclusive and lead to adaptive governance, a time frame, so how long will it take? And finally, potential impacts on surrounding ecosystem. And these are at least a minimum that should be looked at for each different options that are possible for restoration activities. Picking up from the notes and framings and concept that Leet has just shown and explained, let me walk you through the draft framework that we have put together after a series of consultation with the expert group, many of whom are a part of the panel today. The framework was outlined using the circularity narrative and the feedback loop approach. Broadly speaking, it comprises of main components such as organizing a baseline, initiating stakeholder mapping and consultation, identifying representatives and champions, monitoring and evaluation, implementation planning using participatory approaches, gaps and needs assessment, and refining and reforming mechanism through feedback loops. Expanding further on this, let's see at the screen, starting from the box A, which talks about what needs to be restored. This vision can come from municipality, private sector, non-governmental organization, or government agencies, or a mix of these. Then it comes to the second stage. The process comes to the second stage where we, we start with the stakeholder mapping on who can help, who is impacted, who are the stakeholders within the context of inclusion, equity, and diversity. Then another stage in the process will comprise of mapping the current conditions, not just the biophysical parameters, but also taking note of social, cultural, economic and health dimensions of the site recommended for intervention. This is followed by visioning a short, medium and long term vision, taking note of the frames that was explained in the before slides. The next process entails gathering group representatives of people who are impacted and key stakeholders and to present and validate the vision. This would also create a cycle of social learning. This step is followed by a possible outlining of solutions that can come from experts, locals, indigenous settings, if that may apply, along the restorative continuum, and taking note of the guidance framework explained in the previous slide. The fifth stage of the project is when the representative group examines the solutions with the guidances noted in the before slides and gathers consensus on setting priorities. These could be in a temporal or spatial scale. The priorities can be set in a short term, in a medium term, and a long term perspective, which triggers the process to then follow a normal project management cycle through ass assessing feasibility, through outlining implementation plans, uh, putting together a monitoring framework and adjusting the process uh, through feedback loops. The feedback loops will also allow, allow in setting the next stage of the process by through reform and refining exercise. Finally, we know also that it's important to remind ourselves about safeguards related to this process and this framework. 
Uh, and this can be very important risk if we don't consider them very well. For example, in terms of decision, is it a decision that is top down or is it going to be a compromise because you have a representative group of people and stakeholders? And that's something that is important, especially when we look at uh, nature contribution to, uh, to people as well as the SDGs. Ideally, we want to maximize both of them as much as possible. And this means that there should be a very good inclusion of people so that they understand very well what are the compromises that have to be made to make sure that we optimize both of them. Scientific and indigenous, indigenous knowledge are very important. And this is where sometimes, because it doesn't have the same value for everybody, can become a danger, especially for marginalized groups. And this is where also power relations can probably be uh, a trap where uh, marginalized underrepresented groups are not very well uh, voiced at the table. And this can damage them in terms of future uh, activities. And this brings also the question of their rights, rights for the land, rights for activities, and right also for the right information that is accept accessible for everyone. Finally, we have to always remember that uh, the restoration area where the project is being done may have impact on other surrounding systems, and that has to be considered as well. Finally, the timeline versus the funding is also a big issue. Uh, while we would like probably to see results relatively quickly, possibly with funding and the complexity of a project, it may take a lot more time. Finally, community and stakeholder and engagement and involvement is very important in the system to ensure social acceptability and especially the sustainability in the long term of these type of project of restorative, restorative activities. I want to give thanks to Liette and Niti for their presentations and uh, remind everyone again that you have an opportunity to comment directly through the UN Decade website, the Global Consultation on the Restoration Principles. Bethany had put the link in the chat previously. Bethany, if you could put that back in the chat now. Yep, will do. The presentations here have stimulated ideas and inspired people to want to follow the link and take the survey. We'll move to questions and comments now. I'd like to thank everybody for participating and listening to the videos. We are fairly close to the hour. So I'll also introduce now the theme for our next webinar. In August, we will have, again, an update on the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. The focus for August will be updates from each of the task forces within the decade, the science, the monitoring, and the best practices task force. So we hope many of you can join us next month. These are always on the third Friday of the month. And all the videos are posted both on the IUCN CEM website and on our YouTube channel uh, for the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group of IUCN CEM. I'll post those links shortly. If you subscribe, you will get an uh, alert when new videos have been posted. So I'll turn it over now to Q&A. We will stay on past the hour for the question and answer part. If uh, those of you who are available to stay on would like to do so, we invite you to spend a little bit longer with us. If you need to drop off at the hour, thanks for joining. And I'll turn it over to Brock. Great, thank you very much, Kara. That was a, a great presentation. Um, I just wanted to uh, start off here with, um, with a, a great question actually, it came in uh, sort of near the end. Um, what is the difference between ecosystem restoration and ecological restoration? Or are they referred to as the same? Well, I'll jump into a response to that. So the gradient that we showed, the continuum of restorative activities, 
shows all the different types of restorative activities that are defined as ecosystem restoration for the decade. And that includes ecological restoration as an important and powerful restorative activity. Ecological restoration has a very specific definition. It aims to remove degradation and return the system to the condition it would have been in, would have been in now, if degradation hadn't occurred. So a less jargony way to say that is full recovery of native ecosystems is the goal of ecological restoration. Other types of restorative activities that are being defined as ecosystem restoration by the decade include actions you can do like reducing erosion in productive landscapes, production landscapes like agricultural settings. So hopefully that clarifies that ecosystem restoration is broadly refers to a wide array of management activities that are, are in some way contributing to repairing ecosystems. How did I do, Jim? I think I would add one other piece that um, maybe is controversial, maybe isn't. Um, there hasn't been a shared definition of ecosystem restoration. There has been a definition of ecological restoration for a very long time from the society. And so there's been a lot of different definitions of, of ecosystem restoration that have come out, including the recent definition by the UN decade that says everything on the continuum is ecosystem restoration. Personally, I would argue that stopping societal impacts is, a, is beneficial, but it's not restoration. And so I think that we also need to decide what we think is or isn't ecosystem restoration. And that can be um, something that we can have feedback on to the UN decade. I also think one of the other clarifications that we've also often made, and you see this in a lot of the, um, a lot of the content that talks about definitions of ecosystem restoration, that it almost always is about restoring ecosystems for people and nature, um, which ecological restoration is as well. But in ecological restoration, biodiversity will always be included. And in ecosystem restoration, biodiversity is not always included, at least not in the definitions that I've seen. And so I think that's another distinction between ecological and ecosystem restoration. I'm gonna put the continuum up here for people to look at while we're speaking. And thanks, Bethany. I'll add on to um, your comments that the way we've been describing ecosystem restoration has been in the context of the UN decade. And Bethany makes an important point that um, there's a the history of um, use of the word ecosystem restoration with either not a clear definition or varying definitions. But for the purposes of our discussion here, we're talking about it in the context of the UN decade. And in the context of the UN decade, per the principles, ecosystem restoration has to achieve net gain both for ecological integrity and biodiversity and human well being. But again, that's limited to ecosystem restoration for the decade. And we welcome all of you to go to the link and provide comments um, through the consultation process. We're right on the hour. Thanks to those of you who participated and need to jump off. Please do stay on if you have a little bit more time to share with us. Great, thank you. Um, so this next question here, um, I found it to be very timely. Where does disaster risk reduction fit within the restorative continuum? I think it can fit in numerous places. It could fit, it depends what the disaster risk reduction is that you're doing. It could very much fit in repairing ecosystem function. I think that would be the most obvious, but depending on the approach you're taking to disaster risk reduction, it could fit in numerous other categories of the continuum. So I think it's, um, it absolutely fits. It's um, reducing societal impact, it's improving ecosystem management, but, but in many cases it's restoring function so that 
um, when these big floods hit, like the floods that are happening in Europe, or when these big fires hit that are happening here, that the impact is less um, severe and the ecosystem can respond more naturally. And so I, I think if it, it, depending on the approach you take, it would, that would define or, or determine where it would fit on the continuum. Yeah, really, it could fit almost anywhere. But um, uh, on the, the question of risk um, reduction, um, there's another question here that, is there any ecosystem-based priority for restoration activities? like prioritizing mangrove restoration. And here um, there's uh, considerable work underway with the, the red list of um, ecosystems, which provides a mechanism for considering uh, the, the risk of loss of an ecosystem, which can also be um, important in prioritizing um, uh, restoration activities and, and locations. Kara, do you want to add to that? I think um, let's move to another question. OK, great. Um, in terms of principle eight, which involves discussions with relevant stakeholders or participants, um, does language become an, uh, a barrier in the negotiation of meaning? Uh, if yes, how do you recommend we bridge this language being a barrier in ecosystem restoration? No, um, <laughs> Go ahead. Well, maybe I'll start um, and I'll just give an anecdote and then um, my colleagues may want to chime in. But when we started translating the SER International Principles and Standards for Ecological Restoration, um, for example, we, we have run into really big challenges on translating some of those concepts into different languages. And how do you articulate ecological restoration versus ecosystem restor restoration in a, in a different language, in, in, not in English. Um, we did a translation in Spanish that um, ended up not applying to all Spanish speaking countries. And we had to actually withdraw the translation and modify the translation to be applicable more broadly to Spanish speakers because the way our translator had translated it was more applicable to the country that they lived in and that didn't carry to other countries. So even in one language, um, the meaning can be very different. I think what's most important is that we work with people in their languages and we figure out how to articulate these concepts as best as possible in the languages that people speak. And, um, and so English should not be the language of ecosystem restoration. Yeah, I think that the, there's a little bit more of a, a subtle distinction in the question though, because uh, the issue is really how, how do we bring stakeholders on board who may not understand the, the ecology, the, the, the restoration practices that are involved and bring them in that way. And so um, the, really it's, it's a, a question of developing capacity locally. And so that requires having uh, people who can uh, communicate effectively with uh, local communities. And uh, so they understand um, both the process uh, and the, the potential outcomes of the restoration activity. So I think it's, it's uh, very similar in the United States. We have an extension service that provides those kinds of communication and tools and similar types of programs um, I know are being developed elsewhere, but that would be uh, probably the most effective way to, to deal with the local communication problem. And I'll just highlight another principle is that restoration relies on all types of knowledge. And in order to get at local knowledge, indigenous knowledge and practitioner knowledge, it is important to consider both language, but also cultural contexts, obviously. So we need to, in my view, pay more attention to that. And speaking of language, apparently I did not use very good language when I spoke earlier because um, somebody has added a comment that ecological restoration will not take care of human health and well-being. And I did not mean to imply that. What I was trying to imply is that, or to say is that ecological restoration always includes both people and nature 
biodiversity, but in many instances, ecosystem restoration is focused on ecosystem services as a first priority. So it doesn't always include biodiversity. So I was trying to put it the other way, but ecological restoration absolutely does consider human health and well-being. So apologies for my language. <laughs> and I, it might be useful to put a link in the chat to the principles Standards. for ecological restoration. Yeah, I'll do that. And I did show in my presentation on net gain a social benefits wheel and an ecological integrity recovery wheel. And those are both from the standards. So you can um, review the both the social and the ecological goals of restoration framed uh, under those standards for ecological restoration. Great, thank you. Um, another question here. When conditions change, it may not be possible to go back to what an ecosystem would have been. For example, ranges shift due to climate change. How do you factor that into this? Okay, so this is a really important issue within ecosystem management. And you know, it gets at how we must do ecosystem management, all types of ecosystem management in a manner that's consistent with the inherent characteristics of ecosystems. And we know from over a hundred years of work in ecology that ecosystems are not stable over time. It would be very convenient if our world was made up of uh, ecosystems that stayed in the same place and there was a natural way they should be and we just needed to define that and manage for them to stay that way. But we know, of course, that species respond individualistically to their environment and that um, you know, from millennia, centuries, decades, we see disaggregation and aggregation of species into communities, meaning that was probably a jargony way to say that ecosystems are always changing. And it's not just because we're in an era of rapid change. It's an inherent property of all ecosystems. And so of course, with an ecological restoration and all the activities that are being done under the broad umbrella of ecosystem restoration or restorative activities, we need to keep this in mind because our activities will fail if we try to hold ecosystems stable at prior points in time. So for restoration, ecological restoration, the appropriate reference would be the condition the ecosystem would have been in now if degradation had not occurred. So that accounts for background environmental change and it accounts for climate change. In setting references for ecological restoration, however, in selecting ecotypes of species or the native reference ecosystem, it is also important to think about this upcoming rapid environmental change. And in some places, the reference may need to be modified to consider using appropriate ecotype species and the native reference ecosystem accounting for change over the coming decades. And thanks for the opportunity to speak a little long-windedly on this importance of this reference model for restoration and make sure that we're clear that the reference for restoration is not a prior ecosystem and historic ecosystem. And this is well detailed in the standards for ecological restoration that Bethany provided a link for. Um, there is a very similar question and maybe your answer to the previous one um, got to the heart of this. Uh, in principle six, we're required to seek, seek the highest possible level possible from baseline condition. How do you quantify the baseline condition to target the highest level possible? Is there any difference in your answer? To yeah, this? this is great. Thanks so much for these questions because it's an opportunity to um, go into a little detail on the reference model. So the target not being the prior ecosystem, that's what I was speaking about, which is different from the baseline. The baseline is the condition at the start of your project. So you're measuring in terms of your net gain, net gain from the degraded condition at the start of the project, that's the baseline, 
to whatever year you're looking post-restoration. And the best objectives for restoration, clear and measurable objectives, which is one of the principles, establishes what level of gain for each indicator variable you're anticipating through your project. So it should be quantifiable, 40% increase or 20% decrease in invasive species in a 10 year period. And so if you have an objective that's measurable in that sense, it includes a quantity, a time frame, and an action, then you can look whether you achieved it after a certain period of time. So we're um, about almost 15 minutes after. Should we do one more question? We still have about a we we still have a good number of participants with us. So let's do one more. Um, Jim and Bethany, if you can stay on for a couple yeah. more. Um, there there is one that I think we um, might want to address on, on a similar theme, and it says, "How does adaptive ecosystem-based management concept fit into the ecological restoration process?" Um, which I which um, comes back to you know what we're trying to achieve um, and how we go about. Um, evaluating whether we're making process in um, restoration or not. Um, and yes, <laughs> adaptive management is um, a critical part of, of the ecological or ecosystem restoration process, but we have to have a, a mechanism for monitoring um, uh, and establishing uh, the changes that have taken place and have a benchmark to assess against. Uh, whether it's net gain or an impact assessment to make decisions about whether our management um, is moving things in the right direction or whether we have to, to modify what we're doing to um, uh, achieve the, the outcomes that, that we desire. Great. Well, thanks so much, Jim and Bethany. And thanks to all of you for participating. And we hope we'll see you in August when we'll continue on the theme of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration with updates from the different task forces that FAO is leading. So hopefully we'll see you next month. Please go to the survey I mentioned, but I'll just highlight that it closes on Monday, July 19th at whatever hour the end of your day in your time zone. Okay. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Nice weekend. Thank you.